Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ed DeVoe. I'm the president of the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association, the state's first and largest trade association for the cannabis industry. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to another segment of our Lunch and Learn. Today is a very special uh, segment as we have great special guests with us. Uh, but before we get started with the conversation, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Our sponsors today are Argus 365, Burton Trent Public Affairs, Cure Relief, Ease, Financial Resources, Federal Credit Union, Garden State Greenhouse, the law firm of Inglesino Webster with Scala and Taylor, Puffin Entrepreneurs and Investors, Sheet Metal Workers Local 19, Siska Hennessy, the Construction Group, the UFCW, Weeds Direct, and we have a special segment sponsor today, Kova Software. Kova, we'd like to thank you for your support today. And we'll get started with our conversation. As I said, this is a special uh, event for us today. When the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association was founded, uh, we were founded to help the state build a responsible, sustainable, diverse, and profitable cannabis industry. Well, you can only help if somebody wants your help. And so with that, we are really pleased that we have found a, a true association uh, with New Jersey's Cannabis Regulatory Commission. Uh, we know that they've been working hard uh, helping develop that responsible, sustainable, diverse and profitable cannabis industry. And today we are just absolutely thrilled to have with us three senior staff members uh, just prior to uh, the retail portal opening, the retail application portal opening, which is scheduled for March 15th. So this is a really exciting time, a really fantastic moment to have with us today. Uh, Kelly Anderson, who is the Deputy Executive Director, Christopher Riggs, who is the Chief Counsel, and the Chief of Staff, Justin Rodriguez. So I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today and for making the Canna Business Association feel really special. So thank you for joining. With that, let's get into our conversation. March 15th. You tell me the time, the application portal for retail licenses is going to open for the adult use market. So what time and what will I as an applicant see when I enter the portal? So on March 15th, I believe it's 9.30 a.m., uh, the application portal will open. I think uh, what individuals will see is a difference if they happen to apply for a license previously under our medicinal request for uh, applications. Um, this is a system that is interactive. Uh, in essence, it is a one-stop shop for all of the information, excuse me, information that an individual, an applicant, an entity would need to provide. Uh, the system pretty much walks you through all of the required documents uh, from start to finish. It, it asks you, we've, we've included pro tips. So in essence, if there's something that you don't quite understand, you know, please click, you know, do a high level uh, mouse over. It'll give you a pro tip. It'll also give you links pointing you back to the CRC's website. Um, and we think this is crucial because as information in the future may change, we always want to keep a designated location. So applicants know that the information that they are looking for is in this one particular spot. Um, and so there are some instances where the pro tip will tell you, if you have questions about the fee schedule, here's our link. Go right back to it. Um, if you have questions about the personal history disclosure form, here's the link. Go back. You can review it. Even the notice of application acceptance, which gives you the outline of all of the documents and what's required to submit an application, it's there. And so I think um, the most important thing that you'll see is that it is a one-stop shop for everything that you know an applicant will need. Thank you so much for that. So when I get into the system, uh, how intuitive is it? Uh, will I get uh, a notification like, hey, you forgot to check, I agree to the terms and conditions. Uh, will it stop me and, and be that intuitive? Yes. 
So we have set the system up in essence that for each application type, um, there are a set of required documents. So in the event that you do not submit the appropriate document, it will not let you submit your application. And that's how you know, in essence, that you have completed everything that you needed to. Um, and so there, it'll give you a ding, you, you'll, it'll ping you nicely and just say, hey, you didn't upload your business registration form. Oh, hey, you didn't upload your proof of social equity business. Um, you didn't uh, do your tax returns, things of that nature. And so in essence, you won't be able to move to the next step within your actual license uh, application submission until you complete those tasks and then given that you would won't be able to um, uh, submit and then of course it wouldn't come to us so it, it definitely does walk you through and it pings you when you need to be alert of something you may have missed uh, one thing I can and I would like to mention is that in essence if you are trying to upload something and you don't see a spot for it or some something is telling you that you haven't done it we have an others option in the system uh, I welcome you to use that for a document if you can't find a location where to upload it specifically definitely upload it under other um, but also take note that there are labeled sections for each document um, and sometimes it may seem like it's a little redundant per se, as it pertains to, we might ask you if you're a social equity business and you are applying it that you have two prior convictions. That might be in your personal history disclosure form. However, there's also a slot where you upload the document that gives proof that you had um, prior convictions. And so making sure that you, one, complete the forms, um, but also that you are uploading them into the proper section will ensure that the CRC can review and and move the application as quickly as possible. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that information. That That's a lot of information and always very helpful. Uh, you know, when it comes to information, uh, I know that uh, in this round of applications, this is uh, the adult use round. And under the adult use regs, we have the opportunity to uh, submit a conditional application or an application for a conditional license. Uh, can you help us in terms of how much information can be pending uh, before it's an incomplete application? We know that conditional, there can be some information that's uh, left to be pending. Uh, so is there a difference between a pending application and one that's incomplete or a conditional app and an incomplete app? Yeah, I'll take that one, Ed, and thanks for having us. Um, so any type of application can be incomplete and our system designed to pin you when the application is incomplete if you fail to file some kind of required documentation or fail to fill out some question that's on our application system portal. Uh, you know, a conditional application doesn't need some of the things that an annual application needs, such as municipal approval. So a conditional applicant is coming in and what the CRC is doing is reviewing three things. We're ensuring that you have a regulatory compliance plan, that you read our regulations and that you're going to comply with them, that you have a business, a business plan that shows how you're going to, you know, how you're going to make your money, how you're going to set up your business, who's going to run what portion of your business and those types of things. And then you needed a uh, proof that you're going to obtain liability insurance. At that point, if you've submitted all the required information required of all types of applicants, and if you submitted those three things and they're satisfactory to the CRC, though that that license, that conditional license is complete and will move to the board for commission approval. Great, thank you for that. Uh, so in fact, speaking of applications, so you've already seen hundreds uh, with the opening of the uh, cultivation and processing license portal uh, back in December. Uh, based on that, and it might be a little bit different, uh, but is there some uh, some uh, way that, not some way, are there a common mistakes? I'll, I'll be blunt, <laughs> all right? I was trying to be uh, politically correct. Are there common mistakes that you've seen in the hundreds of applications uh, that you've received so far so that you can maybe tip those of us that are looking at March 15th, Com common mistakes? I think I'll take that one. Um, I currently oversee the Compliance Investigations Unit, which houses the, the licensing and things of that nature and, and applications coming in. And so I, there's a couple of things um, that I think we should note here that are important, especially for those individuals who are looking to submit an application next week. Um, and even those 
in the future, given our regulations and the additional types of licenses that are going to come in the future. Uh, and so the biggest one is that we're seeing some businesses that did not fall into the categories or the notice of application acceptance um, categories, uh, which were cultivation, manufacturing and testing labs submitting applications prior to the due date. So for a prime example, we received a couple for retail. Um, we're currently not looking at them. And so when individuals submit applications for licenses that currently are not under review, it takes time away from those that are. And so it, it delays the process um, and it, it kind of it has staff going in, in more directions than we would like them to go to ensure that we can get through this process as speedy as possible. So that's one of the things we're seeing, but it's one of the things that I'd like to plead to, you know, our um, our stakeholders uh, that are thinking of going into cannabis businesses and things of that nature is to please visit our website, look at our notice of application acceptance, look at our website in general, it will tell you when applications are being accepted for each license type. Right now, the next one, as you guys know, is next week, March 15th, and that's for retail, what some people call dispensaries. Um, and then we have not noted what the dates are for the remaining licenses. So, you know, if you're trying to do delivery, we are excited that you guys are excited. Uh, we're happy that you're ready to put your applications in. However, we just ask that you you hold off for a little bit because it just it um, the system takes in the applications and they all go into a pool. And so it takes time away from, you know, getting to the licenses that we're supposed to be reviewing at this time. Um, and I know I said a lot about that, but I, I think it's it's important to note. Uh, some other things that we're seeing are that applicants aren't properly identifying uh, the required documents when they're uploading them into the system. So that goes back to what I said previously. You know, it may be that you're providing proof of prior convictions, and you may have listed that in your personal history disclosure form. However, there's a section where that document is supposed to go. And so if it's included in both sections, the individuals that are reviewing, you know, it's, it's a quick, it's a review. I'm not going to say it's a quick review process. That would not be true. Um, but it's an efficient process uh, instead of having to go back and search and, and, and making sure that everything listed, you know, matches up. Uh, so I think that's really important to, to talk about. Um, what I'm, what we're also seeing is, you know, for these uh, applicants, the, in their actual um, business plan, they're talking about, you know, their management overview. They're talking about, you know, entities that may have interest in their actual company. However, then when we go to review those entity disclosure forms and those uh, personal history to form, excuse me, personal history disclosure forms, they may have given us, you know, forms for partial of their management staff or some of the entities, but they've listed other individuals or entities and we don't have forms for them. And so if the entity and the person is listed, we need a form. And so until we have that form, we have to then reject the application and send it back to an individual to cure. I think what's important to note here is when I say reject, we're not denying your application. That is not what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing is just giving you a chance to fix what um, deficiency is currently in that app, which is completely different than what was happening prior when we did our medicinal uh, request for proposal, where if you didn't include something, you're out. That's not the case here. Um, and so it's you know, very important to remember that. Um, what we're also seeing is that an understanding, you know, we, the CRC listed out uh, three priority categories that individuals could apply through and receive, you know, priority status in their application review. Uh, what we're seeing is that they haven't provided the documentation to support that priority. So though, you know, you, you might click that button and you're thinking, okay, now I'm up closer in line, but now we're reviewing, we don't see it. So now we have to reject your application again so that you can provide that information. Now, an instance where maybe you did it by mistake or um, you did it because, you know, it was just, I'm gonna move my application up. All it does is, you know, it hinders us from moving through this process um, efficiently. And so we just ask people be, to be mindful of when they're uploading and they're selecting their uh, priority designations that they have the proper documentation in which to, uh, I want to say, back those up. Um, also, what I'm seeing in forms is that, you know, a applicant may say that they're a social equity business. However, they may have provided the proof um, and the documents, but what we are also asking for or requiring, we're not asking, we're requiring it, is a social equity business attestation. And so that document, again, it's located on our website. 
Um, actually, if you go to the CRC's website and you look under cannabis businesses, um, we have a complete FAQ sheet. We have on the right hand side documents. Um, and so that document, that attestation can be found there. We need that. We need it submitted, signed. We need it notarized. I think that's also important to note that when they are um, including their uh, PhD and their entity disclosure forms, they have to sign those. You have to make sure that they're notarized. Um, even though you've submitted to it to us and if you haven't signed it and had it notarized, technically it's not a complete document. It has not met the requirement. And unfortunately, again, we're gonna have to reject that proposal. And and I, what is important for individuals to know is the CRC is just as excited about moving these applications around and, and moving them to the next stage. And so we wanna make sure that you guys are providing that information at the start so that we don't have to keep sending it back and we can move through this process and and, and get, you know, get, get it done. Um, I think for the most part, that may be the broader scheme of what we're seeing, uh, but I do open it up for Justin or Chris, if they've heard of any additional things that might be coming up. I don't always remember everything. <laughs> no, Kelly, <laughs> Kelly, you did a great job, but I will. I saw a question uh, on the notarized documents in the chat. You don't have to submit a paper copy of the documents. If it's signed, notarized, and uploaded to the system, we're taking electronic copies. Um, we don't want the paper copies. Uh, don't kill any more trees and save your paper. Um, and then, uh, you know, on the, I saw another question related to, um, social equity status and residency status, the same documents can be used to prove both. Just ensure that you're complying with what the notice of application says is sufficient proof for those specific categories for social equity, business status, economic in, uh, impact zone status, those types of things, but residency is required. No. And, and if you, oh, go ahead, Justin, I apologize. No, I just, the, the one thing I was just gonna add on all this, right, is that, you know, uh, and, and Kelly mentioned this before, if you're missing any of this, you are not getting denied, right? You are not, it is not a denial letter. You're gonna have a chance to cure uh, your application, upload the correct documents, and then you will just go back in line to your priority level. And the only thing I wanna add, and, and just because I know Chris mentioned, uh, the information that we are providing right now and a lot of the answers to some of the questions that we're seeing in the chat right now, if you go to our website and um, Justin, if you could, can you just put the link to the page yep. where the FAQs are? A lot of the, we have a drop down menu for each um, higher category of questions that have been asked. I highly recommend going through, clicking the drop down. What I like to do with sometimes when I forget things, because it's possible, is I open all of the uh, the little down menus and then I do a control left on the screen and search for keywords. Um, for those who, you know, you might have a lot going on and you want to be able to review the FAQs pretty quickly, search for keywords that might bring you to answer the questions that you are looking for. Um, also, uh, there are some things that the, the requirements that Chris mentioned that could meet the impact zones for social equity. If you look at the social equity attestation, they are listed there. Um, so definitely take a look at that. Again, on the right hand column of the website under forms, you will see all of these documents. Sorry, I didn't mean to take it over from me. <laughs> no, no, this this is great. In fact, I, I want to do a quick recap because there were some key elements uh, in, in the information you provided. And again, I can't thank you enough because you all are being so gracious. Uh, number one, those people that uh, will say mistakenly uh, tried to apply for retail licenses uh, back in December or, or January, it doesn't benefit them. The, it does not. There, it, there's no benefit to submitting an application that's not due. That's correct. So, and so if they did submit um, their application has been rejected, they would have received a letter saying, you know, thank you for applying. But at this time, um, we are not currently accepting. However, again, I want to note that when we reject it, again, it's not a denial. So it's sitting in the system and it's waiting for you, um, which also kind of corresponds to another question I see in the chat. Of, Can I start my application process right now? Just have the document sitting there. Yes. So technically you could go into the application system. You could look to see, you know, what documents are required. You can get a feel of how you need to move through the system. Um, and that's fine. You just can't you, you can't push submit. You can't go through that those final stages. And you would have known that you went through those final stages because it's going to ask you for payment. And so once you get to that, you know, hey, let me stop. We're not there yet. I shouldn't be paying for something because it's not my time yet. And so I think for me, that's the, the marker in my head. And I hope that's the marker for you guys is that 
if they're asking me for payment, that means I'm about to submit. I need to hold off, check the notice of application acceptance, make sure that there is a licensed application being accepted at this time. And if there's not, just leave your stuff in there. But also, if you're going to start uploading those things now, it's a good time to QC. I'm, I'm big on quality control. Going back, looking at the notice of application, there's a, it's pretty much written out as a checklist. Use the notice of application as your checklist and just write off, do I have this? You know, did I, did I, did I include this? Download the um, social equity attestation. Literally, it has check boxes on it. Use it as a checklist. Does my, you know, do I meet this requirement? One of the things that um, we're seeing is that the, for the requirement of the prior convictions, I think there's, you can either have at least two uh, cannabis or hashish related um, disorderly persons offenses, or you can have at least one cannabis um, ind indictable offense. Uh, some people are, you know, giving one of the disorderly persons and they think they've met that requirement, but no, that one is two. So go through your documents, go through, you know, everything that you want to submit. I think that's the best thing you can do to make sure that you give it that final, you know, check off. And so that maybe we can, um, we don't have to reject it so that you have to cure something. Great. Thank you again. This is just a plethora of information. You guys are fantastic. Uh, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here uh, because you alluded to them earlier, some of the supporting documents. Uh, so I know that there's been some confusion uh, because in the old medical rounds, letter of support kind of was the support document of the day. And in the new regs, there's a, uh, a call for a municipal resolution. So if you could touch on uh, the difference or, or kind of alleviate that confusion between letter of support and resolution, and I'll combine this with operating agreements. Uh, I know uh, uh, Christopher had uh, touched on it a little bit earlier, uh, but operating agreements and who has oversight of those documents uh, because they are critical uh, and people have criticized them. Uh, so uh, if, if you could talk about letter of support, resolution and the operating agreements and how we have uh, oversight and control of those. Well, I'll take the uh, uh, municipal resolution piece. So uh, first and foremost, if you're applying for a conditional license, you don't need anything from a, a municipality. You don't need you don't need a letter of support or a resolution, um, and that's purposeful, right? It's to give you know people more flexibility uh, with that license and give them the opportunity to go out and find and find a site that works for them. Um, that being said, whatever address or, or physical street address you give for a conditional license doesn't have to be the exact same for when you come to convert for an annual license. Um, now, any annual license, you need a municipal resolution uh, as, as that essentially serves as a substitute for that old letter of support. So um, we will not be giving out any annual license without a municipal resolution. Um, Chris, do you want to take over the, uh, the vendor agreements? Sure. Um, so oversight over the vendor agreements is, is initially, you know, getting getting a review with the application. We want to make sure that the vendor agreement is actually a vendor agreement, right? Because it's do documents are submitted wrongfully in places in the portal where they shouldn't be. So we're first confirming that it is a vendor agreement. And then through, through the conditional conversion process and through the annual licensing process, that agreement will be reviewed by investigative staff and compliance staff and also legal staff to determine if it meets the regulatory standards that are out outlined in our regs, uh, you know, negotiated uh, in good faith. Um, we're just making sure that these folks aren't taking advantage of, of the small businesses that are entering into this kind of a space. Excellent. Thank you. I, I know that has been a real concern and thank you uh, for sharing uh, what the CRC role is there. Uh, kind of in the same light, uh, not not directly related to the applications per se, uh, but if, if you could uh, share your thoughts on this. Uh, when when we were doing the, the legislation, and I know regulatory intent has followed, uh, we wanted to make sure that people that were disproportionately affected by the war on drugs did in fact receive priority. And you made that clear that 
uh, that there are licensing categories that do receive priority. Thank you so much for uh, seeing to that. Uh, but now how does being an ethnic minority, uh, not necessarily somebody that was impacted by the war on drugs, how does being an ethnic minority play into the application process, uh, if, if at all? So it, it, it does play into our, into our process, right? So um, being an ethnic minority, if you're, you know, if you don't have any prior conv convictions, because not everyone is, has, has gotten caught, uh, um, you know, it's, you will still be able to qualify as a diversely owned business as long as you got the certification from Treasury. And that's still a priority, uh, a priority level within our matrix. And that also doesn't stop you from being an impact zone business because you can still employ people from an impact zone or set up business in an impact zone. And that's another different uh, priority level. Excellent. And, and just to piggyback off of Justin's comment, the, the social equity business status was established to capture those folks that were hurt war, most by the war on drugs, right? You got the two disorderly persons offenses or one indictable offense. So that's built into the priority review process. And then those folks are getting, you know, priority review right up front. Great. Thank, thank you for that clarification. Um, I'm going to pause here for a moment because I didn't recognize uh, my host today, uh, which is Smokehouse 1911. Now, I know I've been here before, uh, but I wanted to share that I'm back here again because I am definitely in the mood for the three by four. That's four smoked ribs, four ounces of brisket, and four. Now, I'm partial to the honey Harlem shake wings. But, Those are my uh, favorite too. <laughs> <laughs> but Smokehouse 1911, I, I want to thank you once again for allowing me to do this, uh, do, do our lunch and learn from here. Uh, so before I, I venture off and get my three by four, uh, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Uh, and this may have to do with business planning and maybe actual operations. Uh, so the CRC, uh, in fact, uh, awarded, I believe it was a seed to sale uh, tracking system, uh, and Metric has has that contract. Uh, now that I'm a retailer and I'm doing doing my retail, uh, do I need a separate point of sale system? You need to use metric. You can also have a separate system as well, but you need to use metric and the cultivators need to use the metric plant tags so that we can track the plants from seed to sale and where they're going and where they are in the process for manufacturing and things like that. Um, I believe it's around $40 a month for, for the metric system. Um, and then the plant tags, I believe cost about 25 cents a piece uh, for, for the cultivators. Thank you. Uh, so, as uh, we are coming to a, a close uh, for our regularly scheduled time for Lunch and Learn, I absolutely, again, want to thank the three of you for joining us today. Uh, I know that you've got a ton of work. You've got current applications in the process. Uh, you're still building a state department. Uh, so I do want to give a heartfelt thanks uh, to Kelly Anderson, who is Kelly Anderson Thomas who is the Deputy Executive Director, Christopher Riggs, Chief Counsel, and to Justin Rodriguez, who is the Chief of Staff for the CRC. So I know that uh, there were a lot of questions in the chat. It, I, we, I thank you for attempting to uh, answer some of those questions, uh, but uh, any closing thoughts, any closing remarks on your part uh, because uh, I know you gave a ton of information uh, and we are grateful at the New Jersey Canna Business Association that we've got this association, that we've got this working relationship. So any any closing, closing thoughts? Definitely. I think um, if it's one thing that I can go back and reiterate again to you guys, it's because I believe it's so important, is one, check out our website. Justin put the uh, link in the chat. Um, definitely take a look at our FAQs. Again, quickest way, do the drop down for all of them, do a control F on your screen, do a search for keywords, 
it's key. It'll get you what you need. Um, to do a double check of your documents before you you submit them. Uh, I think that will help us in one of our review process, but also make sure that we don't have to reject items so that they can go back and cure. Again, in the event that you do submit um, an application and you get a rejection letter, we get, again, we wanna emphasize, it doesn't mean you're done. It hasn't been denied. It just means that there is a piece of there is a document that you have not provided and we need to go ahead and get that from you. Um, also, you know, be mindful of when you're checking your priority designations again, because though it may be a small mishap, it does affect the review process and the timing of being able to get these process from A to Z. And so we ask that you guys are mindful of that. Um, I ask that you go and you take a look again at our notice of application acceptance, uh, which is located on our website. And again, at that link that Justin provided and use it as a checklist, you know, go line for line and make sure that you have everything. Uh, one of some of the questions in the, uh, the chat was, you know, if you submitted your information prior, is it going to all just disappear as of, you know, midnight the night before? That is not true. The information will stay in the system. Again, I asked everyone, if you are not applying for a license that is currently open with the CRC, you can go ahead, you can start the process, you can see what the system looks like. However, when you get to that option that says submit payment, just take a break, <laughs> hold off, go back to our website, look at the dates, make sure that it, we are actually accepting licenses for that application type. Um, if you don't see the date there, that means that we currently aren't accepting applications for that particular license. However, continue to monitor the website. When we get to that next licensing group, we will post it. Um, I think if you're having issues in the system tomorrow, there is actually, and we will have it posted um, on the actual website where you, where you go to log into the application system. There is a number and an email that you guys can contact directly. Uh, all of your correspondences should go there because they are the tech support for the actual application system. I know a lot of you, you know, um, email our info license and our and our licensing um, emails. They are more so for the actual applications and things of that nature. So if you're having technical issues please contact the number and the email that's listed in the application system. Uh, also, at the very top of the application system, there's gonna be an FAQ uh, link that you can click there. It's gonna give you some you know, frequently asked questions as well as some of the pro tips and things of that nature. Please use the pro tips. Uh, we put them there so that it can make the, the uh, submission process easier for you, um, knowing that this is a lot of information. Uh, additionally, I think, and, and then I'll, I'll end, the, the last thing is just remember that as part of a conditional license, we need three parts outside of your required forms and things of that nature. It's your business plan it, with your management overview. It is your uh, regulatory compliance plan. And then it is your attestation of that you're going to get insurance. Um, it really is that simple. Uh, all of those additional documents and SOPs and things of that nature, they come into play when a conditional li license goes to convert to an annual license. Again, now if you're applying for an annual license, you're gonna need those things up front. Um, I think another thing, and Justin touched upon this, just to remember for a conditional license, you need to provide us with your proposed location. However, you don't have to have site control at that time. Now for an annual license, you would have to have site control. So just please, as you're looking at the notice of application, remember the difference between the two types of licenses. Um, remember to upload all of those documents. And uh, we look forward to, to receiving your applications and we look forward to standing up the personal use industry in the state of New Jersey. And we thank you for, for having us on today. Thanks everyone. Thank you all. Yeah.